Hey guys, uh, I'm back with another video. This time we're going to be covering implementing an API. So there's going to be less coding this time. Uh, I really went off on one um, mentally the other day and I just coded a bunch of stuff. Um, so, you know, I could sit here and recode that uh, for you guys, but considering my last full coding video got four views, I think I'll, uh, I think I'll cut it down a bit for now. Um, but I do think if anyone is interested in me elaborating on anything, they should just let me know somehow. Um, and I will do that, uh, but I'm just going to go into it right now, um, what I've got so far. Because I think it's pretty good uh, for, a, for a kind of base place to start from. So, I've done a lot of stuff to the source control since that last video. I've now got three projects here. I've got my CCAT Common, I've got CCAT API, and I've got this test application. Which I'm just using to test my API, basically. Uh, make sure it works. So there's a lot to cover because I've done a lot. Like, um, but where to begin? I guess I'll start with covering the API that we did last time because I've made a few changes. Um, so if I open the API, I'll close this. So last time we just had our contracts. We'd created these guys and but they weren't in a contracts folder that's fine i've created one so these are mostly the same i've switched from using bytes um for the packet data uh now i use xml um but that ha that doesn't affect the interface um in the interface it's still just classes so Nothing much has changed here since last time. I did modify the sense type to have read, write, and read, write instead of input, output. Um, in fact, the entire sense type. No, it's not new. I had it last time. Um, I've also done a bunch of stuff around actually organizing my code. So, first of all, God, where to begin? There's so much. In fact, where to begin? We'll begin in the implementations, right? We'll just start off simple. So, we had this iSense. He was an interface. Uh, this was our old friend, the first thing we wrote that has the default state, etc. I've implemented that into a class. It's not the most exciting of classes. Uh, but that makes sense. It doesn't have any error checking. I've been very, very lazy when it comes to my error checking. I should really be, you know, checking that all this stuff is valid values. Uh, like checking that a GUID is passed in, etc. Um, but that's fine. I'm going to do a video on unit testing at some point. I'm going to unit test all this stuff. Um, and at that point, I'll add the error checking, etc. For now, I'm just really wanting to see something work, you know. Um almost prototyping but not really prototyping because I'm doing it to a pretty high standard. So here we have our sense class. That's great. So the user is never actually going to see this class so it's not public. Um, you can see the interface is public which means anyone using this API can use this iSense data type. Um, the actual class itself is not public. They're never going to interact with the class. Um, I think that's just solid API design if you're never making people use concrete implementations just because it means they can mock them out for unit testing um, which is a whole other issue but basically it means that when they're testing their code they can make fake versions and they can control the behavior of it um, it's really really valuable stuff I'll definitely do a video on it because it's one of my passions as weird as that might sound so, then we have the sense provider, which is our implementation class. Again, it's private. Nobody needs to see this. Um, I guess you guys can see it, but nobody who's using the API needs to see it. 
It's implementing the public interface iSense provider and in it we're using a data writer and a data reader. Now these are my classes, they come from CCAT Common. Um, I will go through them a little bit if anyone's interested. Um, I'll probably do a SQL video covering that stuff, like specifically, because there's quite a lot quite a lot of stuff to do with SQL. Um, it's all really interesting. I think it would be worth worth sharing, you know? But for now, we'll just see them as data reader, data writer, right? That's all they are, data reader, data writer. And so we're passing them into our sense provider. And here we have our request sense. So I don't know if you guys will recall this, but we had our request sense methods on our interface, which was where we were going to ask the AI to, to give us a sense and we would pass in the data type and they would the um, the AI would give us a sense back basically and then we'd be able to retrieve that sense using the ID in the future so you can imagine for the light bulb test you could you would create an application that requested a sense that was a light bulb that was just a bool data type from the AI and it would give you one and then you could store the ID of that somewhere in your application and then whenever you loaded the application you could just ask for that sense back instead of getting a new one every time. Theory there being then it would remember that that was that specific button instead of giving you a new button every time so you'd be able to learn while you were running the application multiple times instead of it forgetting everything. Um, I don't know if it would forget everything because it might it might remember the data but coming from different senses but that's that's a whole other whole other ball game um, so the implementation for this guy we have these sense entities which come from um, they come from my database again so I think this comes from the database. Yeah, it comes from common entities, right? So an entity is basically a C sharp class that maps to a SQL server table or series of tables. So it's it's a way of getting your information from your database into your C sharp code. And you do that with a Um, library called nHibernate, or you can do it with nHibernate, nHibernate is what I'm using. Uh, you can do it using nHibernate, which has a lot of XML files that you modify, or you can use Fluent nHibernate, which is where you do everything through .NET. So, as I love .NET, obviously I'm using Fluent nHibernate, because I want to keep it all as .NET as possible, just to keep it consistent. Um, I'll worry about efficiency, etc. later. So we have our sense data type, and so when someone requests a sense, they've passed in the data, they've passed in the sense type, we want to set the sense type of the sense to be whatever they passed in. Now because our database is storing it as an int, databases as far as I'm aware don't really store things as enums, uh, we're just casting, so this is casting, we are saying sense type is a sense type but cast it to an int before you put it in the database. Uh, which works because, <clears throat> you see, each of these corresponds to an integer. So when you say save it in the database, you can just save it as those numbers, and when it pulls it back out, you can convert it back into um, a sense type really easily because of that mapping. So we set that. Then we create an XML serializer. This is where it gets a bit a bit a bit um, heavier. So the data for each sense we are storing as XML, right? We're just storing it as a string, just a series of characters um, in the database. So I switched it to XML just again for simplicity. Um, an XML serializer will take a class or an interface and it will take all the public properties of that class slash interface and 
write them out in XML. And then you can, so that's uh, serializing it. You can then deserialize it again. So you can get that string, pass it in, and it will build up the class and set all the properties for you. Um, so it's very nice. It gets a bit weird when you start having like private properties and stuff, but in general, if it's a nice basic data object or a model, I guess you would call it, then it can serialize everything, you know, and it's, it's, it's good. So what we're doing here is we're creating our sense, we're getting the data type, and we are serializing it into a string. Then we are setting the default data to the contents of that string, so the XML, and then we're writing it to the data store. Now here, this code doesn't even know it's writing to a SQL database. It doesn't know anything about that kind of stuff. All it knows is it's writing to something, and that something wants an entity. It doesn't know anything else. That's the joy of abstraction. That means we could switch it from writing to a database to writing to a file or writing to the memory or writing to anything, you know. Um, writing to a little screen where a guy writes it out on a bit of paper and puts it in a filing cabinet. It's all possible because we're hiding behind these interfaces that are not tied to our actual data storage mechanism in the slightest. It makes it very flexible and it's why interfaces are amazing. Um, yeah, so then we write it to our data store and then I'm just I'm just loading it back out again, just for neatness, just to make sure it works. Very inefficient for me to do this. I shouldn't really be doing it, but I don't care. Um, so what we're doing here is we're just pulling out the data again as a string in a string reader, deserializing it, and then we're returning a new sense object to the user of the API. So this sense object is not the same as this sense object, right? This is an entity from my common DLL, <clears throat> whereas this is a contract from the API. So again, it's, it's that distinction between what's going on under the hood in the common DLL and what's going on in the API that the users actually see. Uh, it's good for keeping people away from your code, you know? You don't, you don't want people seeing all the inner workings of your database, um, and if they were part of your API, people would be able to see that shit. So, it's nice to have this abstraction with an API, actual API DLL, where you can just give them interfaces, because they can't do anything with an interface. They can't infer much from an interface. So an interface can be whatever you want, and then behind the scenes in your private classes, you can be doing all sorts of crazy shit. Uh, it could be anything. Anyway, that's us. So that's what happens when we request a sense. So when someone calls request sense, we go through here, we run it all, we save it to the database, and then we return them the sense that we saved to the database. So they then have a copy of that. And I can show you this. Now first I need to build the database, or I need to publish the database rather. So I'll publish the database. I'll do a full database video at some point if people are interested, but for now, this should publish. There we go. Now I can come here, back to my CCAT database, and you see I've got three tables here, actions, data, sense. I'm not going to go into too much detail on them in this video, but if I do select, I actually nuked all my data, you see, to keep it clean. For this video, I nuked all my test data just for you guys. Um, you see here it's got ID, sense type, default data. So these map to the entity. And they do it via this sense map which is part of that Fluent and Hibernate I was talking about. So it's saying in the database, ID is a GUID that we generate. And sense type and default data 
they just map straight across. You know, it's it's clever enough to know that a string maps to an XML table if the column name is the same. So it, because this is called default data as a property, it will look for a default data table uh, column. And then if it can convert a string into whatever type that is, it will just put it in. And because this type is XML, it happily just populates that with the data. You'll see what I mean um, when I run the test app. So there's a bunch of these uh, in my common. You can see here's the sense entity. It's just a very, very, very basic class. Uh, but then my database writer can save objects. Um, so it's pretty nice. Yeah, there's a lot more to it to do with like this installer class, which is doing all this crazy shit. Um, this is for what's called an IOC container, which is another crazy hardcore thing that is amazing. It means that you don't have to instantiate your classes ever, really. Um, it all gets fed into itself. It's very it's hard to explain just on a whim. Um, but if anyone's interested in knowing more about that, I will do a video on it because it's very interesting and it's very powerful and a lot of people don't know how to do it. Um, but it's worth knowing because it's fantastic. Um, but anyway, the point is there's a lot to this, but that doesn't matter. We're just going to go to the test app. I'm going to try and keep this video a bit shorter because I'm not sure if anyone's even interested in this shit. So here we have my test application. It's very basic. Uh, first thing it does is it creates a container, which is what I was just talking about there with that installer stuff. You create a container, it installs everything from every installer in every DLL, right? So because my common, um, one sec, because my common solution has, or my common project has this installer, which is an iWindsor installer, and my test application has a reference to common, right? That means that this is going to install everything from that common installer into this container, right? So every class that was in that common project that I installed through that installer class, I can install into any application just by referencing my common DLL and um, doing this. So then I can do provider equals and then I can do container resolve sense provider and it will go through to my, um, not my common, it'll actually go through to my API because my API has got the same thing, it's got an installer. Um, so here it's installing both my common and my API, right? So this is what most people would be doing to use my API. They would be using Castle Windsor. They would be creating a container, installing from my two DLLs. And then they would be saying, give me a sense provider. And it in the background will go and get that sense provider class, the concrete implementation, and feed it to them. But they will never know that it is a sense provider concrete implementation. They will only ever deal with the interface, which means you don't really have to worry about people's stealing your shit or tweaking your shit or hacking your shit. I mean, to some extent you do, but that's inevitable. Um, this makes it a lot cleaner as well. Like that is very clean for some setup for a bit of software, you know, three lines, three lines is not bad uh, to get a whole application up and running, instantiating everything from multiple different DLLs. It's pretty good. If you're a coder, you would be would be aware of how nice this is. Um, so then we can use our provider and we can say I want a sense and our data type is just testing, right? We're just passing in a string called testing and that is our data type. We could imagine, we'll go back to the light bulb, bool, right? And the default data type is false. What's that complaining about? Bool must be a reference type. Ah, oh, bugger. I guess I shouldn't have made it, um, made the data type have to be a class. You know what? We'll stick with string. <laughs> I'll fix that up, uh, before my next video. But we'll just, um, we'll just do that, right? So zero 
is, in fact, we'll do false and true anyway. We'll just keep it as a string. It doesn't actually matter from an AI perspective. It would it would treat it the same. So we're requesting a sense with false as the default data, right? So if I put a breakpoint in here and I run this application, we've got our provider, which has a reader and a writer, which is using a SQL connection, which is great. And then we're going to ask for a sense. So because I've got all my DLLs um, hooked up properly, I can actually step into this. I think. Can I? What the hell is my keyboard shortcut to step in? Uh, F10, I thought. Ah, whatever. It's fine. I guess we're not stepping in for that one. I'll have to figure out if my... I don't think my PDBs are in my NuGet package. I think that's the problem. That might not mean anything to you guys, but it means something to me. I'll uh, sort it out for the next video. And I might do a video on PDBs and NuGet packages as well. Um, but we'll see. So, now, you can see we've got our sense. The default state is false. It has an ID, and it's read-only, right? Because we've said we want it to be read-only. But if I go into my database, and I get all my senses... You can see that here, it has stored the ID, the sense type, and our data. Our data is a string with false in it. That's not bad, right? That's pretty good. So then, we can retrieve that sense back by passing in the ID. We don't need to do this, it's just prove that data retrieval works. So this is going to go in, it's going to retrieve the sense, and it's going to have the same details. I should have kept the two in two different variables, just to kind of show that they were the same, but they are the same. Then, I also have this iData sender, right? I haven't covered that too much here, but I do have it, and I'll cover it if anyone's interested. But this is the other part of the API that we've created in the last video. Uh, and this is to send some data. So we can resolve that. And that gets us a sender, which again has a reader and a writer. And the sender, we can send to our sense, right? So we're saying to this sense that we just created, we want to send this data, testing data sending. Right now, I should have that set that to be true, just to uh, you know keep the keep the example going. But what can I say? I forgot. So if I run that, and then we go into the database, what's going to have happened? Well, we've got these two other tables here. If we go in here, you can see here it is. Here's our data that's been sent. It is, it's got an ID and it's got testing data sending. That's what we just sent, right? And then we also have an action. I'm not sure if I explained actions, but an action is some data from a sense, right? And so all this contains, all this contains is the action ID the sense ID and the data ID, right? But these two are called foreign keys. Again, I'll go into the database stuff more if anyone's interested. But you can see that in the data one, 93BF, 93BF, so it's, it's pointing to that row in that table. And then it's doing the same here, 6CEC, 6CEC. You see? But in the code, what's nice about it is that 
if we were giving them back that action as an interface, which we're not because they don't need it, we're actually returning true or false based on whether it succeeded or not. But if we were giving them the action, it would build that up in a nice way where they weren't dealing with IDs at all, you know, except when they were trying to retrieve something from the database. So it would build up the properties. And so that's my test app right now. That's what it does. So I could also do like, uh, I guess I could switch this over to say false sender dot send sense true, you know. Um, what else could I do? See, I could be really, really cool about this. be like um, wow could be like do while input does not equal exit var input equals nothing console dot read line equals console dot read line and sender dot send sense input right so that's me just dicking about but what that should mean I think is that I can do this Right, so if I go here, there should now be a sense that we can use. So this is our new sense, right? 996C. So if I type hello, and we come back here, we should have an action. We do. Here's our new action, and it's referencing the sense 6CEC and the data well actually I think this one might be at number one um, the data 2311 right so if we go in here and we look at data 2311 we see it says hello 2311 then I can go this is a test right can refresh this this is a test is that not amazing is that not pretty good is that not slick is that not a slick API is that not an API that is lovely to use for writing shit into the database personally I think it is I think it's pretty fantastic um, so I'm pretty proud of it the next thing to do is be able to retrieve actions that have been sent from the AI in the API. Um, so I'm going to work on that over the next few days. I'll do a video on it probably in a day or two. Um, I actually learned a hell of a lot making this. Um, so I should be able to do the other side of it much quicker. So that's good. Um, but for now, I'm going to, I'll check this stuff in because it's pretty, pretty good changes actually. I, I quite like the test app doing that. I'll check that in. Updated test app to take user input. Boom. So I'm pretty pleased with that. Um, yeah, I guess that's it for this video. I said I didn't want to make it long, but I've forgotten how long it is. So I'll leave it at that. See if anyone's still interested in all this shit. I realize... I tend to ramble when I'm talking about code, and a lot of it might not be understandable if you don't have a coding background, but that's life. So deal with it, y'all. Um, peace out.